Hello, good morning. Welcome along to Ireland AM on Virgin Media One. We are joined by a very familiar face today. Karen Coster, she's back. Yes, I am at filling from around for the morning and it is a busy, busy show from AI updates to travel tips. We've got plenty coming up on this morning's programme. Yes, very shortly we are going to be marking a new era in the world of technology as European Parliament approved a new law on artificial intelligence, AI. What does it all mean? No idea, but we're going to be finding <laughs> out very shortly. Lots of clarity on that for you. Uh, we'll also have the very latest in travel news, including that recent alert from the HSE of a confirmed measles case on board a Dublin-bound flight. Uh, and any fans of Coronation Street will be all too familiar with the bully Mason Radcliffe's antics. We're going to be catching up with uh, character Luca Tulin, the man behind the character. That's after 8 o'clock. Yeah, he's very sinister character altogether. Oh. Um, this is not a segue, Alan, but good morning to you. You. It's yeah, lovely to see the you. The sinister idea <laughs> is over in the corner. <laughs> now, all week we've been cooking some Irish food in the run-up to St. Patrick's Day. And today is no different because Edward Hayden is going to be serving up us a slow a beef stew. Slow-cooked beef stew. Sounds delicious. And they're the brainchild of country star Nathan Carter. Kyo will be stopping by after nine for a very special chat and performance that you don't want to miss. Now, Derek's in Kilkenny this morning. From Kyol to you, I believe Tradfest is going to be happening there at the weekend, Derek. Absolutely, Al. We have a cracking morning of Kyol down here in County Kilkenny. Following our trip to Cove in Cork yesterday, we've landed down here in the Marble City and it's another, another very wet start out there this morning. Still that status on to Cork and Kerry. Status, yellow rainfall, warning for Waterford and go away until midnight later on tonight so we're not out of the woods by a long stretch unfortunately just yet. Now, Kilkenny City is where we're at this morning. You may notice a massive Ferris wheel. Look at it there. Just over my shoulder, the gearing up for St. Patrick's uh, Festival weekend and we've got a morning of trance and lots of crack lots of kill coming to you live here from County Kilkenny right across the morning and will that rain ever stop guys it's pouring here oh, <laughs> come on. absolutely oh. miserable Derek oh, hopefully you're cameraman uh, hopefully <laughs> Nile. you're going to be oh. inside for that thanks <laughs> <laughs> You're very welcome back. It's time now to take a look at this morning's papers. We'll start with the Irish Independent. Far-right party and leader sued for defamation. A far-right political party and its leader are being sued for defamation by a businessman whose home and B&B in which he previously had an interest in were the subject to anti-immigrant protests. The 12 million euro deal that bought coalition survival. That's top story on the Daily Mail. They say they have obtained internal documents which highlight a grubby deal by the government to secure votes from independent TDs to support lifting the eviction ban. The Herald goes with bad vibes. It details that a carpenter who admitted carrying out a nasty drink fueled unprovoked attack on an adult store worker in Dublin has been handed a four month suspended sentence. The sun goes with King of the Hill. Racing royalty Willie Mullins was all smiles yesterday as he became the first trainer to rack up 100 Cheltenham winners with the clincher ridden by his son Patrick. That's class. Uh, a few of the other papers leading with that story. The Mirror's headline, hats off to Willie. The star lead with 100 to some. On a different note, the examiner leads with a former Cork convent to house refugees. A convent in Cork is among five centres announced by the government as new integration centres for Ukrainian refugees. And finally, the Irish Times lead with extra 500 beds identified for migrants as thousands of Ukrainians leave hotels. An audit of emergency accommodation for migrants has found about 500 extra beds despite hundreds of asylum seekers remaining unaccommodated. So join us with that story and everything else this morning is Sarah McGuinness, Assistant News Editor with the Business Post. Good morning, Good morning to you. Sarah. Morning. Sarah, great to see you. So the government now have announced these new houses for Ukrainians. Uh, the, also the new rules that are going to come in where Ukrainians will receive €38.80 Euro instead of the €232. Euro. Uh, and just be offered 90 days of state accommodation. That's all. So this is all happening today. A very big shakeup. Yeah. Yes. So there's been, as you mentioned, five accommodation centres announced. So they are in Dublin, Leash, Limerick, Kildare and Cork. And they're going to accommodate about 2,000 people. And um, there are 
you see, it's a bit of a convoluted one because yes. we, this came out yesterday and then the examiner are reporting today that that centre in Cork was actually previously already used to house refugees. So the, the question is kind of, are these extra beds coming on stream or are these beds that the government are just kind of repurposing and putting back out there. That's the question I had on this, because yeah. it said that Ukrainians currently accommodated in the convent will be moved to make way for new arrivals. But where they're going to be moved is the question. Now, the Irish Times are reporting today that there are 2,500 unaccommodated beds already okay. in stream which is absolutely wild when you see that, you know, like all the tents lining up to the International Protection Office. There are a rake of empty beds already in the system. Um, the government have kind of said that for whatever reason, like the provider just doesn't want to fill them for whatever reason, or they're like single beds and these are families that need to be accommodated, things like that. But As in they're saying it's families that are lining Main Street that we saw in the footage in the news earlier and that they can't go into these centres. Yeah, it's all, yeah, it's insanely, it's really, really, really convoluted. Now all the measures today are just for Ukrainian refugees so they're not like international protection um, right. applicants but it's still like it's really really wild like the people who are in centres such as Cork are going to be moved to different centres to move new people into the Cork Centre. It's it, it, it just doesn't really make sense. Mm. It's not very clear and I don't think it's going to be easily communicated mm. to the public. Um, but yeah, like basically the story is that they have a rake of extra beds, they're announcing a rake more, but they're also kind of saying at the same time, like, stop coming here. It's yeah. all very confusing. <clears throat> uh, Sinn Féin's TD for Cork North Central, Thomas Gould, has accused the government of reheating uh, this because if they're not making it very clear, this leads to misinformation and this is where people get upset. So should the government, and I know Leo Varadkar has spoken about this and he's kind of said, we're not encouraging people to come in, but of course we have to look after international applicants. Like if, if the government aren't, aren't gonna, like we just saw with the referendum, they weren't very clear mm. with that. If they're not gonna be clear about what they're doing about migration, Surely it's just going to spread misinformation. People are going to get the wrong message and it's going to just end up as trouble. Completely. And, you know, like, I think this is such an emotive issue for Absolutely. so many people, as we've already seen, that I really, like, it's just a little bit worrying. Um, like the Taoiseach has said in Washington, like, you know, there hasn't been that much resistance to the accommodation of Ukrainian refugees, which is problematic in itself. So I think he's kind of hoping that the, because all these measures are for Ukrainian refugees, that people won't be getting too upset about it but obviously you know like the whole discourse is very emotive you know as we've seen like people get very angry very frustrated and aren't mm. afraid to display that um, but also the really big issue that's happening here as well is the amount of support for Ukrainian refugees is just being absolutely slashed yeah. the, it's gone yeah. from 232 to 38 euro yeah that is insane yeah. and you only have 90 days in state accommodation this actually happened really like fascinatingly in New York over the like not too long ago where basically they said come here we'll welcome you in basically kind of trying to say like we're a city for everyone and then once like they got too many people yeah. in they just completely slashed everything they could it and they said oh only come here like if you really need to that's exactly what's kind of going yeah. on here so the deterrent to, is there to make it look like we're very open but at the same time and to be, listen to be fair like there are so many people trying to find rental accommodation at the minute so if they do get turfed out after 90 days mm. good luck trying to find somewhere I mean yeah. it's so so difficult uh, and Leo Varadkar just said that he hopes that the announcement will announcement will not lead to protests we will see what happens with that we'll uh, continue with Leo Varadkar because yeah. obviously he is over uh, in America at the minute uh, with Joe Biden and he's talking about um, he made a big speech that we just saw at the Ireland Funds dinner as well how it's interesting, this is an RTE article, though, that he believes Joe Biden's uh, heart is in the right place in relation to the violence in Gaza. Yeah, so Leo Vardker, before even heading over, the word on the street was he's really going to give it to Biden about Gaza. He's going to go over, he's going to come in really strong, he's going to say all... That basically restates the Irish position on Palestine. Um, not that that's really going to make a big difference. Not that that's but, really going to make a big difference. But, but when you think about it, you know, like, and we still are very much Arab, but we would have been in quite a small minority of countries who are very much pro Palestinian. Now the rest of the world 
Mm -hmm. Thankfully, Caught is quite catch <clears throat> is catching up. And I suppose our position might not seem as relevant or as forward thinking. So Leo Varadkar's going over there. He's going to double down on this. But also he's kind of saying like, Asher, Joe, you're doing your best. You're doing your best. You're, you mean well. But really, you know, like, it, but also it kind of does have to be said, I don't know, I'm not a diplomat. I don't know how much diplomatic efforts are working at the minute. He's, he's going to try and use that to his leverage when he's over there. But also um, doesn't want to be con too controversial with him, presumably. Doesn't want to rock the boat too yeah. much, no, because he is going over there and like, you know, the like it's very much a business endeavour. Yeah. He's going over to platform Ireland and not to sell Ireland, but to basically, you know, show how great we are. So, yeah, yeah that, a part of that will be finding the balance. Um, quickly, we'll just move to another story in the front of the examiner. We see Derek out there with the under the umbrella. So yes. Terrific. Oh, Okay. There's a yellow warning, I think, in the southeast uh, overnight, and talk about uh, rainfall in Cork as well. So I love this story about in Middleton. So it's some New Zealand operated system to report tsunamis has been used to try and uh, alert the locals to yeah. uh, flood warnings. Well, we like we all remember like the floods in Middleton. That was devastating. Um, so this man from New Zealand who is living in Middleton basically was like, lads, why the hell are we not like doing something about this? Like mm. there are ways to track this. So as you mentioned, it's like they use it in New Zealand to like detect tsunamis. But there are these like little sensors that are usually used in like oil tanks or something weird. And they're just like lining like the like what bodies of water with this. And um, like they will basically go to an app on their phone. And it, it's not going to, you know, obviously it's not going to stop the flood, but it will give businesses like a heads up, uh, like yeah, like a couple of minutes to move all yeah. of their stuff to a high and dry place, which is brilliant. So, now, brilliant. But all the businesses in the town are funding it. It's going yeah, to cost listen, about fifteen grand. Yes, but listen, you'd be doing that if it means that yeah. you can save this your business. True. Um, okay, last one. Do you have any kitchen appliances in the house that you've had for years and you never used? I live at home, so yeah, we have a really good thing. Like, we have so oh, an old food processor or something. Yeah, we have. Uh, like to be fair, like my mom does try to use them, and we have like we have like purged a little bit. Like since COVID, we've like you know spr sprinkling. Yes. Them. But um, yeah, like it, it, there's a rake of people who the average kitchen has 216 euro of worth of unused appliances. Uh, one in ten have more than 550 euro, which is like absolutely wow. insane. But also it's you can see used. how it happens. Like you get something that you're kind of like this is brilliant, you know? Like yeah, I buy it all. Yeah, yeah, no, buy like, it all on Instagram. Oh, if I see, I. I I'm, and I'm not shopping with Amazon anymore. But you <laughs> should, if I saw something on Amazon, oh. I'd be like, in my basket, I need that. We yeah. got um, given a, a bread maker for Christmas, never been used, still in the box, still in the cupboard. And a tagine thing, like, Ooh. yeah, never used. Do you have anything at home, any kitchen appliances in the kitchen that you've never used, maybe still in the boxes? Uh, and it's been there for 10, 20 yeah. years. We'd love to hear from you. Actually, even send us in a picture of it. We'd love oh, to yeah, see it. Oh, yeah, the old school ones. Um, Absolutely. 0896 triple one triple one. Um, Sarah McGuinness from the Business Post, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Lovely. Uh, coming up, we're going to find out why Europe is finally cracking down on AI. And if you've yet to book your summer holiday, we've got some exciting new travel news that you may want to stick around for. We'll see you after this break. Now, thanks for staying with us. Uh, it was a historic day yesterday in the European Parliament when it finally gave its approval on the new AI Act, the world's very first legislation on artificial intelligence. So, like you, <laughs> what exactly is it and how will it change things moving forward? Well, we've got tech journalist Elaine Burke here to tell us. Good morning. Good morning, to Elaine. You, Elaine. So the AI Act, can you break it down for us? Yes, I can. So okay. because it's actually Thank been... Thank God for that. <laughs> it's because, because it's been in the works for such a long time and reporters like myself have been following this story for a long time as well. Uh, it actually predates this explosion of AI that we've seen in like the last year and a half or so. And they actually had to go back on the wording on it to kind of incorporate these generative AI okay, systems so they saw that we're this now coming, seeing. Right? Yeah, they absolutely saw the kind of the power of AI and the fact that it was going to Progression. require regulation. And like, you know, regulation does move slowly, but they have been able, I think, to to try and keep some pace with these technological developments here. And it's a very broad sweeping act. And some of the terms may seem very broad, but it's because this technology is also so broad and mm. they are trying to regulate for something that they may not know is going to exist yet. So uh, what does it do? So it's... Uh, 
basically classified AI in four levels, <coughs> excuse me, and it's unacceptable risk, high risk, uh, and then there's kind of like low limited risk and like a more medium risk. So there's four levels and that top level of unacceptable risk is banned with an asterisk, I will say, because some of facial recognition technologies and what's called real time biometrics, which would be like scanning faces mm. using like CCTV or something yeah. like that, is going to be allowed in time limited and very specific circumstances to do with law enforcement. Okay. So say if it's a case of a missing child or mm. a, a terrorism investigation, they would still need to go through a lot of checks and balances to get approval to use it in those cases. But it is going to be ha have limited. But is uh, that not being used there. already? Uh, well, like we have heard of things like that happening and there's a company called Clearview AI, which was actually like scraping massive um, publicly available and also not so publicly available sets of image data for faces yes. to create like a facial database. Mm. Now that was already banned in a lot of countries and this, this will actually outright ban that kind of activity. Okay. So that kind of like uh, scraping, mass scraping of data to try and build these data sets for facial recognition is outright banned. What about uh, say misinformation? In, in, in being able to doctor videos yeah. or doctor pictures. So one of those, that would be uh, under this category uh, of these systems that have generative AI and they will have to be labeled as such. So anything okay. that is uh, creating deep fakes will have to have some sort of watermarking, digital fingerprinting that makes it identifiable that this was definitely created using AI and people will be able to see that and notice that. Now, to be aware of that is to also know that like that's how legitimate companies will operate. Mm. Uh, there will be legitim illegitimate suppliers of, of these so technologies it. as well who won't apply that, but the, the hope is that they will be in the minority. How do they enforce it? That is actually a big question. Mm. So what's going to happen is uh, this this vote is substantial, but it's not the final stage of the act. It's now going to, to go through a review process for the language of it to finalise it, and then there'll be a final vote. And all that is expected to go through That's unopposed. That's next year, and each country will well, have to vote. Well, each country will carry it. Year. Yeah. yeah, and it's expected that about May we'll have the final stage is done, and then uh, every member state will have one year to appoint a body that will have to oversee the enforcement of this okay, act. So, so within Ireland, within a year from May, we will need to know what body, what uh, organisation is going to be in charge of enforcing this act in Ireland. And in Ireland, it's a very interesting decision because like with the GDPR, uh, Ireland is the space where we have the headquarters of a lot of companies that are yes. working with this technology. Yeah. OpenAI just recently opened an office here in Dublin uh, to wow. create uh, a plum and uh, it was a big deal for Ireland Inc. So uh, who will, who will then police it then here? So Do we that's know? what we don't know yet. They but have, they will. They have to. Would it be under a government department, or would it be an outside agency? Oh, absolutely. Like, yeah, it would be the government will have to appoint a body to to look after this. And whether that's an existing body or a newly formed body, we don't know yet. Okay, wow. very. It's very very interesting because we're all hearing so much about artificial intelligence and thinking where is it all going. So it's good to see that there is potentially some regulations coming into it. Let us know what you think mm. on it. Oh eight nine six triple one. Triple one. Uh, let's move on to a potential ban of TikTok. This is in the news again this morning. Yeah. So, this will, in the US. Yeah, mm. is, is TikTok going to be banned in the US? So uh, what the House of Representatives has voted on is a bill that requires TikTok to be sold within six months of being enacted or it will be banned. So actually they're trying to demand a sale of TikTok from the owner company ByteDance, which is Chinese, uh, to I would imagine what they want is an American entity Facebook, to yeah, own Meta. it. Well, that's the big question here is who will buy it. But then and is that a monopoly then? If, if it was the likes of Facebook or I should say Meta. Meta or any of those companies that already own a social media platform, massive antitrust questions will be raised. So it's not actually very likely that they will bid for it mm -hmm. because they're likely to have legal challenges and not succeed. Uh, this actually already happened. Uh, so the Trump administration in 2020 moved to ban TikTok if it wasn't sold. The exact same kind of framework we're uh -huh. talking about here. And it ended up that a deal between Walmart, which is a brand people will be familiar yeah. with, and Oracle, Super which is kind of like an old or tech brand that's probably lesser known outside of the tech world, um, because Oracle's leadership teams happen to have ties with the Trump administration. Okay. Now, that deal, by the time of the changeover of government, had already suffered legal challenges and completely fell apart in the administration changeover. So it didn't actually come to pass at all. Um, this could happen again. Uh, we could see, because it, it, it has to pass, it's passed the House of Representatives, it has to pass the Senate. Mm -hmm. It would then likely be challenged and it could end up going as far as the Supreme yeah. Court. And can you okay. tell us why they want this to be sold? That's, yeah, a very good question. So uh, there is a question of, you know, a Chinese-owned, a parent company and a subsidiary of that 
having such influence in the States. So they're worried about two things and it's influence. They're, they're calling it like a, a primary news platform for some people because people do actually get their news mm -hmm. through social media mm -hmm. a lot of times these days. And they're also worried about data leakage to China. But what they're not looking at is legislating for all companies to have better data management principles and data protection policies in place. They are targeting one single company. And that is that looks a bit more yeah. spurious and it just looks like they are just targeting this one company that has links to China. And that's what some of the detractors will say. Had, and it's against free speech. Yeah, so and, and we've had all this, there. isn't it, that China are spying on us. That either they're, they're spying you, don't buy cameras from China because they they put something in that they're spying on us. So yeah. is it getting down to that kind of nitty gritty? Well, the issue of data leakage at TikTok it isn't completely unfounded. There was an, uh, a couple of investigations that found that practices had happened that were questionable. Mm -hmm. um, and in one case, it was uh, someone had tracked the data of a journalist to try and uncover their sources, which is a really terrible thing to happen and shouldn't happen. But again, if you're trying to stop that, you should be trying to stop that across all, all platforms. platforms. No yeah, platform exactly. should be allowed, allowed to enable that. So could this happen? If uh, ByteDance don't sell to an American owner, can they actually stop people, make people have to de delete the app from their phone? Because TikTok is huge. And yeah. I would imagine there'd be massive ramifications yeah. so for if, young people in America. So the likes of the Apple App Store would have to take it down and Google Play would have to take it down. So you wouldn't be able to access it through those. Okay. That's usually how people get their apps. And that sounds like an easy fix. But when you have an app that's so popular, uh, yeah. They have hundreds of millions of users in the States alone. Uh, and, you know, you have a lot of tech savvy users as well and people who communicate a lot online. People will find a way yeah, in if it's not through the legitimate app store. So they'll actually encourage deviation from these secure practices through app stores. And it's also like it's not addressing some of, some of the issues that they have is that there's people on TikTok sharing stories that are seen as anti-US government yeah. and anti-US. Um, that kind of thing happens with online media anyway. I've been seeing that since the Bush okay, administration. Yeah. And yeah. likewise across all Yeah, platforms. and it's not enough to, like, rather than actually address the societal issues that are being raised mm -hmm. by these people, they're trying to ban a service that they use to communicate. And it's all, every move seems to actually reinforce the beliefs of the other side here, which is okay, quite okay. challenging. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, would you like to see TikTok ban? I mean, like, it's 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 insane, yeah. the, the popularity of it as well. It's just mad what's going on, but no doubt that is going to be a story that's going to keep on rumbling. 0896 111 Elaine, you're going to stay, stay with, with us. us. We're going to have some more tech stories Great. coming up after the break. Yeah, we'll see you in a few minutes. Now, if you're not teched out, you will be by the end of this. <laughs> We've even got more tech news for you. Really, it's uh, interesting. It's very stuff interesting. Here now. Yeah. Uh, Elaine Burke has stayed with us. Uh, thanks very much, Elaine. So we're, we were talking about artificial intelligence and all this new regulation that is coming in, but ChatGPT, we've just seen how much it has exploded. It's mind blowing what it can do. But this is a new one then. So Sora, so Sora is able to from a text, text what you want, it can create an animation, is it? A, a whole video, and it can be a lifelike video as well. It can oh, look like It's incredible, by just people. texting in, so say if you text in uh, Tokyo walk, a woman walking down a street, text it in, and it develops a whole video for you. Yeah, so if anyone's actu actually interacted with ChatGPT, it's quite like that, where you can say to ChatGPT, write an essay yeah. on X, yeah. Y, or Z. Uh, you can now, uh, using Sora, write a text prompt and receive a 60 second video. Uh, now it won't have any audio synced in the video or anything like that, but the video does so look So there is, so if impressive. I just text in, woman walking down the street in, in Tokyo. Tokyo. Here wow. we go, yeah. this now, is the woman. If you watch closely, there is a point where her legs switch places while she's walking. You, you need to be watching places? very closely. It's something oh, I that saw it there a the little human body shouldn't do, yeah. basically. <laughs> but yeah. this is the early stages of this. Yeah. And, and it's not available to everybody at the no, moment. not at the moment. Although the CTO of OpenAI did an, uh, uh, an interview very, very recently and says that they're planning for public release of this in wow. within a few months. Wow, that's, that's going to be huge. Uh, we have another one, we might as well take another look at another example. Uh, cherry blossoms in the snow, do we have this one? Um, cherry so blossoms in the snow. Yeah, like, okay. that looks yeah. amazing. So, but I, I will could... say, if you see the signage there, that's the signage that's supposed to be in 
Japanese, presumably. Uh, apparently, it's absolute gibberish. And you'll see that with AI generated content. We saw it with the Glasgow Willy Wonka experience, the enshrining oh my entertainment. God, yeah. and but the even still, for me, TV. looking at that, like but I wouldn't obviously, yeah. like you would be blown away by it. So for yeah. advertising and for all sorts of. And they're saying yeah. for animation and people who are working in the animation industry, this is going to change Massive things. impact. Yeah, and it's not necessarily, I like. I'd say for advertising, because it can do 60 second videos that look really glossy and like we saw there kind of have this kind of perfection side to them. I'd, I'd see that as a huge threat to advertising mm. because you can create this really what looks like high production value video Massive. from a text prompt and, and it, it gives you 60 seconds that you can put whatever audio you want. So over say it. an advertising company like Coca-Cola or Cadbury's decided I'm going to take one of these, put our own little bottles in it there. Do they have to pay a fee? Well, see, that's what we don't know yet. They've said that they're going to publicly release it, but is it going to be a paid subscription model? Is it going to be uh, something that's fr free to use in yeah. some aspects, like with ChatGPT? So one version of ChatGPT is free to access, whereas a more powerful version is part of a paid subscription. That's what we don't know yet. I have a friend who has a paid one, and it's insane, yeah, the, insane. the pictures yeah. and stuff they can do. But well. let's we see have a bad example. Yeah, so okay, we I want to see this. Grandma's birthday clapping. OK. Uh, let's see. Happy birthday, so Granny. I was watching how the people clap in this video. It's like... No oh. people, and that oh, way her fingers is gone a bit very mad. Very odd. <laughs> and also when Grandma blows. Oh yeah, she's like she's clapping, she's like clapping, and like they're like. Okay, I know. But you know what? I'm just saying, sixty seconds. You're just going to look at that. You're not examining. Exactly. People don't look at it too in yeah. detail as well. It's like okay. a Kate yeah. Middleton picture here, where I'm like <laughs> examining where <laughs> the hands are, right. where. So where what they, sort yeah. of impact? So you're talking about advertising this because it have a hu huge impact on jobs. We're talking animation industry mm. as well, like. This artificial intelligence, although the legislation is coming in, like it is going to have a revolutionary impact totally. over in the world in the next five to ten years. Yeah, and it's absolutely like you should look at if you're in the creative industries about like maybe learning to work alongside this technology because, like I said, it's not like you see this. This is an example for animation, and uh, this actually looks quite good because animation Amazing. doesn't have to have a base in realism. It, you know, it can be a little bit more yeah. fuzzy around the edges. And there's already lots of computer generated animation targeted at children that has popped onto YouTube Kids and churned out over and over and over again. And it's quite low quality compared to the high standard children's programming that you get uh, from, you know, yeah. the likes of Bluey, which yeah. is like oh, wow. quality yeah. storytelling and stuff like that. Funny as that. But that will generate money for people. So what I actually would see is an explosion in what looks like high quality content from low quality providers. Okay. Rather than that, so many jobs will get displaced by it. I think you'll actually just see people who have less budget to do a high end perfume style ad or less budget to do this kind of yeah. animation. Can, can you, can you edit your own things into these? One thing that you can't do that Sora has said that they've put restrictions on is put people that are recognizable figures in there. So I can't say generate a video of Tommy and Alan having a dance in a ballroom. It won't do that Thank because God. they were named entities and <laughs> I thought that would I, I thought that would get two, out one day. <laughs> <laughs> two left feet. Um, let's move on to another story, which is uh, one I didn't think about. Uh, so Airbnb are going to ban indoor cameras. Internal cameras. So this yeah. actually wasn't really part. Changes to the company policy will come into effect at the end of the month. So actually, kind of, there's no ban on actually doing it at the moment. Yeah, I suppose they've seen it as a gap in policy that okay. you know they hadn't covered this, and that it is something that you know, has become more commonplace that people are fitting out their houses with these cameras and uh, even sensory activated cameras and stuff like that. And it's indoor cameras, but also you can't try and eschew the rules by having an outdoor camera Looking that points in. inside. So this is so the internal cameras that were allowed in open areas like sitting rooms and kitchens, but yeah. not in bedrooms or bathrooms. Yeah. And I think it's actually seems to have been inspired by a Saturday Night Live sketch that joked about an Airbnb host <laughs> having a camera in their bathroom and then Airbnb comes out with this policy change. Oh, it's like right. somebody looked at the policy after that and said, oh, actually, we, we don't have any rules on this. So, yeah. So that's going to come into effect. And you still, if you are booking an Airbnb, you, you have to be told that there's a camera outside the property. Yeah, anything like that should be disclosed by the host. Now, the question there is like how well policed yeah. that is. Like yeah. is Airbnb checking that everyone is disclosing exactly what they should be? But it should be then, you know, that 
the community can feed back on that and say this wasn't disclosed in the property that I visited. And um, let us know at home. We know the Airbnb market is massive in Ireland. So you have cameras. Ha have you cameras inside? Like, have you caught people robbing stuff, wrecking stuff? Has it been really beneficial to you? Or have you stayed in an Airbnb and seen a camera and been a bit freaked out by it? Uh, let us know. 0896 111 one. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, Elaine Burke uh, for Tech Sake podcast. Yeah, it's back. Great. Very it's soon. back. Very very soon. Soon. Oh, well, looking forward to that. Thanks Thank very you much, so much. Great to have you with us. Now, still to come, Coronation Street star Luca Tulin joins us. Uh, plus, we're going to be joined by funny man PJ Kirby, all coming up here on Ireland AM. Well, from a measles outbreak on a flight to Dublin to the introduction of new transatlantic flights, it's been a busy week in the aerospace. It certainly has, and travel journalist Owen Carr joins us again this morning. You're very welcome back, um, Owen, because when mm. anything happens in the travel industry, we call on you because yes. you're the man who knows it all. So the latest on this then, I mean, the HSE has informed anybody who was on that flight to get in touch with them and to look, look for symptoms. Mm. But in general, for flights in general now, and people travelling, is this going to have an effect on people? Not really. There's nothing really going to uh, impact on travel. People are still going to... We're going to see me more measles across Europe. Yeah. Austria is a particular hotspot at, at the, the moment. moment yeah. Nobody cancelling. Aviation's approach to this is they'll do everything to help the health authorities. They know where someone sits on an aircraft. They know who's near them. A lot of where it's harder to trace is what happens, bus to the car park, airport before you take off. Uh, means it's very serious. We know from what happened 1999, 2000 in North, uh, North Dublin, yeah. uh, when young children, uh, three young children died. We know also that um, it's not really like what happened during the pandemic in that it's really the uh, compromised, the pregnant, the under 12 months old. They're the cases you want to worry about. But you're a carrier once you've been in contact with a carrier. So and that's where uh, tracing and where someone sits in an aircraft is important. So you can't see airlines then asking for proof that you've been vaccinated or anything like that in the future if it does get bad? Interestingly enough, you and people forget this sometimes, you're not supposed to fly if you have been diagnosed with anything infectious. It is an absolute no-no. was that always the way, even pre-COVID? It, it, it? it can lead to your travel insurance being cancelled or challenged if something Gosh. happens. We saw it during the pandemic that airlines got people to sign a form saying they weren't, they didn't have symptoms or mm. press your app yeah. to say you hadn't got... That's the only time it's actually been implemented as forcefully as that. But the way the, the record-keeping for medicine has been revolutionised by what happened since the pandemic and the way we're moving, we'll probably see a situation in years to come where uh, before you get on an aircraft, you're going to be, have to give some sort of assurance you're not uh, showing symptoms. Wow. So what would your sort of common sense attitude to it be that if you are a little bit nervous about flying, would you wear a mask or anything like that? Or would you just be, if you have Easter plans, if you have summer plans, just carry on as normal? Masks are still there, more so in Asia than in Europe. But you still see on, you know, depending on the demographic, people wearing masks on flights. Yeah. Um, what, take normal precautions about, uh, what, you know, make sure that you are going to be in a company of strangers and you don't really know what yeah. uh, to see. And it varies from country to country. You people, uh, viewers will know, uh, will have been in those flights from Africa where they spray for mosquitoes and, you know, uh, there are different risks in every everywhere you go in the world. So take the normal precautions. But an absolute no-no is if you're suffering or having a, a, any sort of You're not infectious supposed disease, to board a flight. Do not board yeah. that flight. Okay. You're putting now, other people... You could be sitting beside someone who's compromised. And yes, you're compromised. exactly. Uh, the ongoing... Um, Controversy Boeing. with Boeing, mm. and this is going to have yeah, yeah, this is going to have an effect on us because Ryanair is one of their largest customers. Yeah. What's happened is Boeing only got to deliver 27 aircraft uh, um, in uh, February. They have been told by the authorities they can't deliver uh, anything like they, they want to deliver. What were they supposed to deliver? They're supposed to be delivering about over 40. It'd be pre-pandemic, okay. they'd be doing 50 a month. And oh, 50 a month. The, wow. The, the whole thing had slowed down anyway. Their are part supplies. Ryanair's part in this, the Boeing, the, first of all, the nine, the, the Max 9, the one that caused the problem, the door blowout, 
Ryanair doesn't have that, ha doesn't have it on order. It does have other Max, the Max yeah. 10 on order. That's going to be slowed down and it also is going to be 17 aircraft short of what it expected this summer. That means it's had to trim 20,000 seats a day. That means routes that uh, had frequent, higher frequencies are being trimmed back. Ryanair is looking all through Europe, trimming back its schedule. There's another problem with Airbus. Pratt & Whitney engines have meant the grounding of a lot of European fleet. That means that flights by other airlines have been trimmed back. When the availability goes down, the prices, prices go, go up. up. So we're all going to get affected this we're summer then? We're all going to be affected by both Boeing and Airbus. And the Airbus problem is actually a little bit bigger problem for Europe than for America. If you're flying in America, you're generally on a Boeing. If you're flying in Europe, you're generally on an Airbus. Ryanair is flying in the middle sea of Airbuses. But all those stories that come every day about another Boeing incident are because almost every aircraft in America is Boeing and some of them are related to uh, aircraft, uh, the airline maintenance, not directly back to Boeing, but oh, Boeing have right. a lot okay. of trouble. Let's themselves. finish with some good, good news. news yes. because this is exciting. Great news. This is exciting yeah, 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 news. Tell us, Jetline. Uh, or JetBlue. Oh, JetBlue, sorry. Yeah, very important airline, low-cost airline, Northeast, very big brand in Northeast mm. America, flying transatlantic uh, daily from Boston to Dublin. The first one arrived in this morning, Jane O'Brien from the, uh, the customer department was on. Joanne Garrity, the CEO, didn't actually make it. But they are flight, in Dublin she? at the moment, taking off this afternoon. The two flights came down just, before, just within the last hour. And they are there for the summer. Very, very strong demand. Hopefully they'll extend to year round. And that means that everybody else's price you know, if the JetBlue are flying into JFK, not into somewhere in the middle of nowhere, uh, Norwegian, mm. into Stuart International. People will remember that. They're flying into JFK. That means Delta and Aer Lingus, who both fly JFK, the prices were pushed down a little bit. Now, it is very interesting. Demand has been so strong. If you're looking for July and August, I noticed the prices. Uh, yeah, because I was looking at it and yeah. the business class was outrageous on it. And then even the prices. Business class. Right, no, I love that. <laughs> Sorry, I was even just looking to wise. treat myself. Okay. But I, then oh, I was. The grapes, looking, the grapes are a bit sharp. Says no, but I was you. looking yeah. at, the, at all the all the levels in it, like just to compare <laughs> yeah, it to yeah. Erlingas and to Delta. Like we have, we have such a great, we, we we have a great supply to America from Dublin with all the airlines, Absolutely. don't we? Absolutely. And uh, we have we, we've said we've more, no, more than 20, 24 flights a day running through the summer. There is no other country uh, that has that level of transatlantic coverage because we've new route from Aer Lingus launching to Denver in May, yeah. and we have uh, f increased frequencies. We've we've returns to places like Hartford, so we've got great transatlantic services, and we've got very good prices to the extent that people fly their Ryanair into Dublin to get the other ones on, not even Ooh. connecting. Yeah, flights. I've seen that. Yeah, and it's a great. Uh, it's, it's huge for inbound tourism, much more important for inbound tourism because JetBlue's brand is much stronger in North America than, for instance, any of the other, uh, than Aer Lingus would be. Yeah. So getting those extra daily flights in, hopefully they'll be year round. And, and cheaper, uh, pri cheaper prices for everyone. They the prices down for everyone. Kept Great stuff. Right on. Oh, and thank you so you. much Thanks for joining so us this morning. Always a pleasure. Uh, coming up, Coronation Street star Luca Tulin will be joining us. Uh, uh, we're going to take a quick break. We'll see you in a few minutes. You're very welcome back. Now, any fan of Coronation Street has been glued to their current storyline. And to be honest with you, I don't really watch much, Cari. Mm. We all know about this. Absolutely. About bullying. That has been making headlines all over the last few weeks. We're joined now by Luca Tulin, who plays Weatherfield bully Mason Radcliffe. But before we chat to him, let's take a look at the actor in action. Wow. This I need to say. Oh. All right, Lee. You stay away from us, you hear me? Whoa, 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 calm. Get out. Calm. Get out. Okay. Okay. It's all right. It's not gonna hurt you, okay? I won't let him near you ever again. You have to go down to the police station. How come? Right, you don't know, lad. That ginger copper was asking me all about that knife if I'd threatened Liam. Liam got to you, didn't he? You are. That's why you dobbed me in. No, I didn't. Right, then Liam's grass was up, wasn't he? I tell you what, I wish I had that knife right now. I'd teach him a right lesson. Right, so what happened with the police? Nothing. Got now on me.
Oh, Luke, it's good to see you this oh, morning. Man. How are you? Oh, I'm good, thanks. How are you guys? Good. You probably don't get to watch very much of your own scenes back. Had you seen that yet? I had seen that yet. Okay. Um, but it's, it's always a nice refresher to see how much of a horrible human being he is. Yeah, because I've seen worse clips of you, actually. Um, you play such a sinister, unnerving character. But, like, this was your first professional gig. So what was it like being launched suddenly into the stratosphere when it comes to signing up to a show as massive as Kari? Mm, yeah, it was, it was daunting. I mean, especially because Kari was something that had always been a part of my childhood. So there was, there was an extra added level of pressure that I had to do this role justice because it's like, it's a boyhood thing for me. Mm. Um, but it was, it was, it was pressure. And I think I've learned over time to sort of deal with that and, and, and use the pressure instead of let it get to me. Uh, and your first gig getting into into Kari is amazing, but thrown into such an amazing storyline and being the really bad guy in yeah. it, of course, Mason yeah. Radcliffe. Yeah. When you were reading this script, like, was it, is it daunting when you realise that this I'm going to have to be pretty evil here? This is going to be uh, this is going to be a tough part to play. Yeah, it was daunting. It was daunting and exciting in equal measure. I mean. Like those sorts of characters are the juiciest to play. So it was exciting in a sense, but I also knew I, I thought this is going to be a, a bit of a challenge. Um, so I really had to do my homework. I really had to, you know, make sure that I got the essence of this character right. And he didn't look like some big, pathetic idiot on screen. And he actually had a little bit of something to him. Yeah, you definitely have edge for sure. You talk about wanting to do the role justice and you worked with the NSPCC. What was that preparation like for you? Yeah, it was great. I mean, they they were so helpful in just sort of giving us an insight into what, you know, what 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 these situations look like in real life, how they play out and, and you know, what the psychology behind that is. And, you know, for an actor that, you know, fortunately I haven't experienced being bullied. I've never bullied anyone myself. It's 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 a good insight behind the curtain to just see the harsh reality of it and how common it is, um, which I, which is why I think it struck a nerve with so many people. It, it was interesting you mentioned that because I was going to ask you, were you bullied in school? Because you, you play this part as the bully so well. And I think the reason that the storyline is so massive is because bullying in school is is mm. you, like it's in every school and as much as we try to say it's not and how we're trying to get rid of it like it's part and parcel of growing up and uh, do, do, have you had much feedback you know from kids who have been bullied or from parents who who've been in similar situations and this has really touched with them yeah do you know what like coming into the to the you know the, the role i didn't expect it to have the amount of feedback it has and i think that's been so rewarding. I've had loads of messages from kids and parents saying, you know, my son's been bullied, my daughter's been bullied, or I've been bullied, and, and you know, this has helped me to to deal with that and speak out. And you know, the reason which that helps people, um, you know, is all subjective to them. But whatever it does, it seems to be helping people in, in a certain way. And yeah, I just I feel yeah, I feel very lucky. Um, um, so I've had that impact. I think one of my fears as a, as a parent is my kid being bullied, but also what if my kid becomes the bully? So when producers were speaking to you about this role, do they tell you what has happened to your character to make him the bully? Or is that something that you have to create yourself? Um, I think that, well, hopefully we, we will get to explore some more of that on screen. But I think initially, um, they didn't know the size of this so i had to sort of create this backstory to to round this character out because when you're just getting scripts that are, you know he's just being horrible he's being horrible he's being horrible he's bullying that you need to round it out mm. and, and create something that that makes sense as to why he's doing that otherwise it, it can become a bit two-dimensional so yeah. in order to round the character out i made this big backstory um just to give him a bit of substance <laughs> Give yeah. him a bit of substance. Yeah. Like, yeah. You, like you obviously get really into it because like this is such a big role. It's new for you. Uh, we know like yourself and Liam, of course, who is a kid being the character being bullied as well. Like you get on great on set or whatever. But is there fun? Like ah. whenever, do you, whenever you step away, the camera's not rolling. Uh, like how do you kind of decompress whenever you know like you've just been through a really um, 
pretty horrific story. Well, the 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 thing is, I'm I'm the newbie. I'm the rookie on the show. Um, the two guys alongside me, Liam and Charlie, they're sort of veterans of the show. So as soon as they caught cut, they've got me on strings. I'm sort of the butt of the joke. I'm the <laughs> one that, that gets it because they've been there for ages. Um, and I, I'm sort of the new kid on the block. So it kind of balances out. And I think you leave, you leave so when we're doing the knife scene and, you know, the, the heavy, more physical scenes, you leave so much on the camera, on set. That by the time you finish, you're exhausted, and it's you, you you don't have anything left in you. So you know when they're giving you stick, it sort of it all balances out. Yeah. I guess. And Luca, in terms of creating the backstory uh, for your character, is he a Man United fan? Tell me, is that what you wanted to check out? I want to know. Of course, what, he's a Man United fan. What are the I jerseys? Love that, you asked that question. <laughs> have you you see the the wait? It'll be on that side. Yeah, have you seen the United nice. post? Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, listen, yeah. that that probably deserves the bullying in itself. <laughs> oh, are you, are, you a, are you a scouser? Are you a, oh, a listen, Liverpool fan? I, I'm actually a Leeds fan, so don't talk. <laughs> That's why I got bullied as a kid. <laughs> 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 but uh, fair play, to, you're putting yourself out there with the jerseys on, on display on Skype anyway. I know. <laughs> I'm opening myself up to a world of hurt because it is difficult being a United fan at the moment. But I have faith. I have faith in Ten Hag. We'll be back for the glory days soon. The glory. We'll see. We'll see. Well, listen. Uh, okay, I just have. To, like, do you get? Do people on social media? Do you get any like abuse and stuff on you? Because obviously you're playing a character, but it's such. A, uh, well, not, you're not the heartthrob. Well, you are, but you're not. So not you're... very. Yeah. Uh, no, but no, are you I'm getting? Fine. Are you getting? Do you get abuse or even walking down the street? Um, yeah, like bits and bobs. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I knew, you know, Corey prepped me very well because they, they sort of sat me down and they said, you know, this is what's going to happen. People are going to say these things. Just be ready. We're here to support you. And, you know, I, I, I think you sort of become numb to it eventually. I think um, you just sort of brush it off. You do get the comments where it's like people can't distinguish it and, you know, having a go at you and, I don't know. I just, some, I try to just laugh and, and say, well, you know, if they believe it that much, maybe I'm doing my job exactly. right. Exactly. You're um, knocking it out of the so, park. Uh, that, that's yeah. brilliant. That's actually really amazing to hear that Corey do that and they kind of prepare you for this, that you're going into a tough role and they actually have you lined up for it. Well, listen, um, uh, keep it going. I, I know you got arrested on Monday night's episode, uh, but no doubt we're going to hear a lot more about Mason Radcliffe in the future. Um, Luca Toulon, thank you so much for joining us this morning. It's a pleasure to talk to you and uh, good luck with supporting Man United for the rest of the season. <laughs> <laughs> good luck with Leeds. Thanks for having me on, guys. Thanks, uh, Good stuff. I'm loving the cooking slots this week. Coddle yesterday and of course St. Patrick's Day is on its way. So what says Irish more than a bowl of stew? Oh, I can't, and what says Irish? Nothing better than Edward Hayden's stew. I am really excited about this, Edward. He won't give us any till the I'm end of the, just thinking end of the I had slot. Come, during the week I had decided I was going to wear something in Kelly Green today. I'm only thinking of that now when you're mentioning St. <laughs> Patrick's. Well, exactly. I had it all ready. I said I'll wear Kelly Green. Well, but anyway, consider it to be Kelly Green. It is. And, uh, Don't worry, you've got the stew. We're happy. Yeah, absolutely. It doesn't yeah. matter what, what we have on. Now, Again, of course, St. Patrick's Day is a day laden with tradition, isn't it? Yeah. And different people do different things, whether you might go to Mass and then go to the parade afterwards, and then maybe you, you might go... to Mass on St. Patrick's Day? Of course, it's a holy day. Oh, of course. Of I obligation. Yeah, no. On the day of the parade? Yes. Um, the Mass happens first. Some <laughs> Saint do Patrick. Some, some do and some don't. Yeah. There you have it. But again, people might do that. They might go to the parade. They might go for a few jars afterwards or whatever, and then kind of come home. So you mightn't know what time people are going to be there for dinner. So this is something that works really Really well because you can have it and just let it Heat simmer it up, away or, yeah. or reheat it. Yeah. So just for the purposes of um, the slot, I've just started in my casserole dish here, browning up some diced stewing beef. So I just have that browning up really nicely. And then I'm going to season that. Now I told you before about the salt and pepper. I tend to kind of crack it onto the work surface rather than putting it over the yeah. pot so that the kind of the steam doesn't go into the kind of the salt and pepper grinders. So pop oh, in a little okay. bit of that and reminding people it's always just important to put it on once the beef has sealed off so as not to extract all of the moisture 
out of it. So kind of brown it first, then put on that. Would you always do a beef stew because people do a lamb stew and, and I do, do a, a lamb mince stew. stew. Yeah, I and again, I do a stew. mixture. So I'm doing beef this morning. Lamb would work perfectly well for this recipe. Or you could do a mince stew. Or I was so telling, much. pardon? Mince yeah, well, I so wouldn't much. throw my clothes you don't off like for a mince it now, stew. I have to say. I, do, I love but, a mince stew. But I, I know a, a friend of mine, her mother, her late mother, used to do a mixture of both. She used to do a stewing beef and mince right. in the one stew. Now, is this stewing beef? It is. This is stewing beef. Yeah. So now, it's I'm gonna quite put in, cheap then. Absolutely. I'm going to put another bit of oil then. And then you're going to just put in a selection of vegetables in there. So what I've got here is I've got some leeks and celery in my bowl. I've got some carrots in there. I've got some turnip. You've got this on turnip. a very high heat. I have it on Edward. a good high heat and I want to brown it off until I get the liquids okay, in. Okay, because I thought this would be like slow cooked. And it so certainly is going to be slow cooked and like really tender. I want to brown it off first. I want to kind of brown off the vegetables because it's that sauteing off of them is extrapolating the from flavor. them all of the flavour. Okay, so get all of that out. Give it a nice little mix around there because any of those veg and the beef, you don't mind them getting a tiny wee little bit charred as they go along as okay, well. Grand. Now, I've also got a little bit of garlic. I'm putting that in. A little just, bit. A little bit, absolutely. <laughs> Have a cup of garlic. Curb your enthusiasm on St. Patrick's Day. But again, you, think of celeriac. I have to get home that think of well. Oh, yeah, that's true, yeah. This is the passion killer. <laughs> um, put in the garlic, put in some mushrooms. Celeriac work really well. Again, sometimes people might take some of the baby potatoes and put those but in celeriac. before it's cooked. Celeriac is kind of like the root bulb of the celery, so it's kind of that white, oh, uh, okay. white Bottom kind of, of vegetable. It's quite nice. But um, the beauty of it is with the baby potatoes, you have it all in the one pot. Mm. You know, everything is in there together. Okay. Now, I'm not the biggest fan of that. I kind of like there to be a little bit, bit of, of deconstruction. Side or something. There's Speaking of which, side. I have oh. the mash. <laughs> Tommy, are you weak? Up, Tommy. Are you oh. weak? No, oh, he's ready. You can and you know what? Yesterday we were talking about cod, and we'd love to know you at home. How do you make your stew? Is it a beef stew, a lamb stew, mince stew? Have you got your own recipe? Oh eight nine six triple one triple one. We got so Our, many texts yeah. about the coddle yes. And does anything beat an Irish stew? Like, is it the oh, most yeah. Irishy of Irish meals? Yeah, well, yeah. it's a warming thing, and I mean, it's like a trifle or a brown bread. Everybody makes it their own way. There's yeah, the kind yeah. of the regional variations, but there's the household variations yes. as well. What's In there, I'm going to put some flour? plain flour. Okay, so put that flour in and just look then that that goes quite dry and quite ruffled, just like so. If you had a bit of tomato puree, you could put that in there as well. Yeah. And that would work really nicely. Because it is the feast day and a day of celebration, I'm going to use a drop oh, in a of wine. Red wine. So I have a bit of red wine there just for that indulgence. And I'm going to put then some beef or some chicken stock or even a bit of vegetable stock in there as well. And, and you don't use the wine. That's not to deglaze the bottom or anything? No, no, I don't need to. I'm going to use that as a kind of a flavour of the yeah. sauce. Okay. And also it will give you a nice deepened colour there as well. Okay. So you can see what I'm doing then with my wooden spoon because the flour will have kind of stuck down there. So with my wooden spoon, I'm just getting all of that off the bottom off the vegetables just like so. And then I'm going to put in some herbs. So I just have a few little dried herbs that I'm going to put in there just like so. And then there's a couple of options that you have. You can either do what I'm going to do is take that, bring it up to the boil, stick it into the oven for about two hours or thereabout, or you could happily leave it on the stove top. You're talking about 170, 325 or gas mark three. Okay, so for about two hours, yeah. Right. Uh, you can leave it there for two hours. You can it's leave it on the stove to top. It's easier to do it in the oven, isn't it? Well, because the beauty, if it's on the stove, you have to keep. You have to keep an old stir on it, you yeah. know, because it will it will take. So uh, the one that I did last evening, I made it in the oven, and I've just popped it back yeah. into the saucepan no, here this morning this. to redo. Oh, so oh, no. I've got my lovely little quenelle of uh, of mash. What's the so I'm going to give you a little, just that kind of a shape, that oval a little rugby uh, ball. shape, Posh. little rugby ball, Very yeah. Ode to Tommy. There you go. Six Nations, of course, coming up this oh, weekend. Yeah, there there you, you have it. Well, this is the perfect dish for after that. Oh, and yeah. then I'm just going to put a weekend. little bit of uh, that on the top there, just like so, for each of you, that lovely stew. Goodness now, I won't do it because I know you'll give out to me, but if you were at home, I'm advising people that could take a little bit of parsley go on. and throw it do on it the for top. A picture to there make you it have it. Make it look there you, there you go. So little bit of parsley on the top uh, would be lovely. But again, of course, you can have that with the mash. If you wanted then to have some leftovers, you could put some leftovers maybe into like a casserole dish, put a bit of puff pastry <laughs> and a bit of mash on top of it and make a pie out of it. Uh, oh, which would yeah. be absolutely gorgeous the next day. I tell you, I'm in my element here. Coddle yeah. yesterday, stew today. I'm telling you, they're spoiled. Oh, very hot. Um, gorgeous, Edward. Thank you so You're much. You're very for welcome. That. And hope um, everyone now, has a nice St. Patrick's yeah, Day. Happy St. Patrick's Day.
Coming up, Derek is going to be lacing up his Irish dancing shoes. Very yeah, guys, hot. he's in Kilkenny at Tradfest. We'll see you after this. It's very hot. Mm. Stew, has it's it's cool. lovely. Oh, Edward Stew, I tell you, we're keeping it St. Patrick's Day. Yeah. For the week that's in it. Absolutely. Yeah. As we said, we are kicking off our St. Patrick's Day celebrations nice and early. Why not? And where better to start than Kilkenny City, where Derek is soaking up all the excitement. Yes, it's Treadfest. Derek, how are you getting on? Yeah, Garamina Mango, Team Tommy, Bjorn Show, Kunta Kil Kanig, Ruth House is where we're at this morning. Marion, sorry about the rain. Oh, it's okay, Derek, but you're <laughs> going to take it right back to Dublin with you. <laughs> Absolutely. Anyway, Brendan and Marion are with us here this morning. And Brendan, what a weekend you've lined up here with Tradfest. A phenomenal offering of traditional Irish music on the way in Kilkenny over the St. Patrick's Bank Holiday weekend. We have in excess of 90 free gigs. 90? 90. <laughs> Nine zero, Derek. 90. Um, in the various pubs and venues uh, throughout the city. And uh, almost 40 venues taking place as well. So an outrageous amount of wonderful live traditional Irish music on offer over the entire weekend. The first gig later on tonight. Later on tonight is the first gig. The headline acts are not starting till tomorrow night and uh, involved in those headline acts you have everything from the Hot House Flowers to the Tulla Cayley Band, Irlo Leonard, John Spillane, a wonderful selection of, of international acts uh, to include even our own Burn Church, a wonderful Kilkenny uh, bunch of musicians. Also tying in with Shot on the Gaeilge as well. Uh, Sinead and Gondouter Bay. Yeah. And uh, there's so much activity throughout the city in every sense. I mean, you'll have the leg stand staff us. <laughs> well, stay around, Derek. Stay yeah. around. We're you, not you, budging. You, We're not you, leaving. You Kilkenny. might enjoy it. Uh, Marion, what have you got festival wise lined up? Oh, my goodness. We have an amazing amount of activity this weekend for St. Patrick's Festival. We have four days of non stop fun. As Brendan mentioned, Trad Fest. We also have loads of family activity. We have a vintage fairground. I think you were there this morning. We, were. we have circuses. We have our a parade. We have five marching bands coming in from the US. The first one is in today. So an amazing amount of activity happening for everybody. Uh, lots of free events. We have fireworks in the Castle Park on St. Patrick's Night after the, our, our very busy parade. And on Saturday night we have pyrotechnics uh, fire show in, in the grounds of, of our local authority. Who is the Grand Marshal this year, by the way? Uh, Richie Power is this year's okay, Grand Marshal. Former so Kilkenny Harlan. Indeed, and we're really looking forward to having him this year. We're, we're very, very proud to, to, that he's accepted the honour. And hopefully the rain stays at bay. We'll come back to you in a few moments' time, Gurmeen Mahagut, uh, to Marion and John. Now, over here to Sophia and Zara. And Zara, never mind the St. Patrick's Festival weekend because you're focusing on the bigger picture. What have you got in store? Yes, we have the World Championships down in Killarney starting next weekend. OK, and where are you ranked in the world at the moment? Currently, I am ranked third in the world, so hoping to maybe improve in a bit. OK, hard. get that top podium spot, right? Oh, yes, I have a big age group of a lot of lovely dancers, so... Now, you were also across the pond quite recently in New York. Tell us what you were doing there. So a summer or two ago, I was over in America doing a few little shows in a summer programme. And as part of that, we got to do a flash mob in Times Square. A flash mob, Irish dancing flash mob, right? Irish dancing flash mob. <laughs> I can imagine what that was like, right? Oh, it was crazy. And lots of people stopped to watch, so it was really interesting. What about you, Sophia? Where are you ranked in the world now? 25th out of 200, but they're a tough competition to try to get up. Absolutely. And you, you were actually Leinster, you were in the Leinster Championship, right? I came first in the pre-open Leinster Championships. OK, and you get inspiration from your big sister, yeah. right? She looks after you, do you? Yes, I do. You do. You look forward to the big weekend as well? Uh, yes, I love St. Patrick's weekend anyways, yes. It's is, is going to be fun. Now, I believe we've got a live performance coming up in a few moments' time. Um, tell us, have we got a website, Marion? Com. And who's playing and with us behind? Our very own bunch of musicians from Collage de Pobble, Austri, here in Kilkenny. OK, enjoy this one. Take it away.
Fantastic. So, so good. I'm just waiting for Lord of the Dance to come in. Yeah, yeah, where is Michael? Mike? We got where's Michael? Where's Michael? Get on, Derek. Derek. Michael He'd have the, the headband <laughs> on as well. Hugh Derek. Derek's Derek. struggling with a bad back there at the minute. <laughs> uh, well done to everybody yeah. down there in That's Kilkenny good. this morning. Look at that. And isn't it great to see young people starting traditional music and dancing the same as Shopton and Gelgi Estate? Absolutely fantastic. Fluent Irish. Fluent Irish. Fantastic. My daughter loves Irish dance as well. It's brilliant. There we have it. Thank you for that, Derek. All right, still to come, podcaster and proud Cork man PJ Kirby tells us how he's mastered the art of the Kayleigh. Oh, keeping it all there Irish. And we'll meet the band who recently became one of the Ireland's fastest growing artists on TikTok. It's Kyol. There we go. We'll see you after the break. Now this week on Ireland DM, we're escaping to a whole new world with Disney's Aladdin. This critically acclaimed Broadway and West End musical will have its Irish premiere at the Borgosh Energy Theatre next week and run until Sunday the 14th of April. So it's the perfect treat for all the family if you want to do something this Easter. Yes, Aladdin comes from the team that has brought us other beloved Disney productions such as Beauty and the Beast and, of course, The Lion King. We are giving you the chance to treat your bestie to an overnight stay in the stunning five-star and entire The Marker Dublin Hotel. VIP tickets to see Disney's Aladdin along with some exciting prizes. To be in with the chance of winning, just tell us about a friend you have who is like no other. Of course, because that's in the musical. You ain't never, never had, a had a friend like me. There you go. And well, why they well. deserve to be celebrated. You can get in touch on Ireland M. Comp at virginmedia.ie and the very best of luck. Aladdin, I think, is one of my favourites. Yes, yeah, great. When show. that was released, it was, it was Robin mm. Williams was the genie. Yeah, yeah. It yeah. is a fantastic great. film. So I'm yeah. sure the musical does. The music is dying to see it. I actually time. really want to go and see it. If it's that, anything yeah. like the likes of the Lion, uh, the Lion King and yeah. stuff, amazing. Yeah. yeah, the very best of luck with that. Now, earlier on, we were speaking about um, kitchen gadgets. Have mm. you anything in your kitchen that you've never well, the used? The oven, the sink, the fridge, <laughs> the wine fridge is used, the champagne wine fridge, fridge is used, and uh, 216 euro worth of onion used appliances in the average kitchen. Yeah, Mike says, lovely. I have a carving knife. Remember we all bought Oh, carving yeah, yeah, yeah. Knife. That were, was taken out of a Sunday, maybe. <laughs> uh, a carving knife, a slow cooker, and a George Foreman grill oh, that George I've Foreman, used yeah. once in all of them. So he used the carving knife once, the slow cooker once, and the George, George Foreman grill once. That's all he's ever used them. I, yeah. for, I forgot about this one. This definitely reminds me. Neve, uh, I decided to make, make my own orange juice to be healthy, so I bought an <laughs> orange juice maker. Used it once. Came home last week to find my mother pouring my store-bought <laughs> orange juice down the sink. But I think we have a, an orange juice uh, maker. We have the smoothie maker, the juice, put all the apples and yes, stuff in. Yes. And a mess of it. It's all sitting in the back of some cupboard. Yes. Oh, I see that. What a uh, waste. Jade said, I haven't used my oven since getting an air fryer. Are you an air fryer person yet? Am I what? Oh, really? Love it. It's never off. Oh, Constantly. That and the coffee machine are the two. Actually, Donald Skeen recently said we need to rebrand air fryers because it sounds like a deep fat fryer. And I think people think it's like an yes. unhealthy way of cooking, yeah. but it's actually a healthy way of cooking. So you almost need to call, call it a mini oven is, because it's a game changer. Is Donald houses. working for Ninja at the minute? Is he? I don't I'm know, but I'm also available for any endorsement deal. Yeah. Donald wants to cut me in I'm there. going to get one then because everyone. Oh, you'd love it. It's one. so easy. Oh, just even to stick the sausages in or anything. I'd use it because if only the two of us, yeah. I, I put everything in the oven. So it's quick. But if you're cooking for the whole family, do you get everybody's food into it? No, it's mostly for the kids. Okay. Yeah, oh. it is mostly for the kids. Um, yeah, the definitely. Look, Daniel's very... one there. Yeah, you read that one. You'll do it justice more Why? than me. So, me job. and my wife have been married for 16 years and ever since we've had something in the kitchen <laughs> that's completely useless. I really hope she doesn't throw it out because I like living there. <laughs> that's, that's a good one. Well done, uh, Daniel. Yeah, of... completely useless in the kitchen. <laughs> a lot of us feel like that. Uh, <laughs> thank you, you cook. Huh? You cook. I do cook, but certainly when it comes to the cleaning and whatever else, not. Um, we all have our uses. Exactly, just allocate the jobs. Um, uh, okay. Thank you for your text. Exactly, thanks for getting in touch today. Now, after the break, we're talking marriage prep and making our mammies proud with comedian PJ Kirby. Stay with us.
welcome back. Our next guest is a dancer, a podcaster, a comedian, and a one-time drag queen. And we're going to find out if it's not just one time with uh, Cork <laughs> icon PJ Kirby is here for a chat. Morning to you, PJ. Morning, PJ. PJ. Great to see you. Uh, we have a lot to get through we here. Do. Okay. The dancers a bit that interests me because listen, yeah. everybody knows you from uh, I'm Grand Man yeah. podcast, of course, which is huge success. But trained as a dancer and what I see you like you're six foot four yeah. like yeah, you're a big Italian. guy yeah <laughs> I, I, how was it how was dancing trained to be a dancer at it, that it was height? grand it was just like we'd be in rehearsals and they'd be like okay everyone needs to be on the same level and I'm like it's grandma for Susan who's like five foot <laughs> but like my knees are gone lads literally but how do you even do you go down your knees yeah you just learn you do a squat like you learn how to squat yeah wow. very well yeah yeah <laughs> squat yeah. dancing yeah. it was definitely like a workout yeah, yeah. Um, I loved your piece with your mum. Was it in the Irish Examiner for Mother's oh, yeah, Day? Thank your mum you. is Nula, is it? Yeah, Nula's me, mummy. Oh, what, did, you, did you enjoy doing oh, a yeah, shoot she, together? She, she's like a duck to water. <laughs> yeah, she's always like, oh, I'm going to be mortified. Then the minute she gets there, she like turns it on. <laughs> also, she put me to shame. Like, she's posing the house down boots. Oh, she's brilliant. brilliant. Right, because, like, you have the, ah, the look podcast, at her there with the of spreads. course. Like, were you just a mummy's boy? Like, from, oh, from... yeah. Yeah, Day one. and I'm the youngest, so like I was like, I'm the favourite. Well, like, I say it when I'm home. I'm always like, when we're at events, I'm like, after my mum's, after a few drinks, I go, go on, mum, tell me, go on, <laughs> just say I'm the favourite. And she's like, I can't say that. And I hear like, you took her out dancing though. Yeah. Oh, so you weren't the favourite then. So yeah, we went down for Mother's Day, and me and my sister brought her out for um, a lovely dinner, and then afterwards we were like, we go for a drink, will we? And then she was like, ah, go on, so, but we're home early because she keeps, she's all like, I'm home early, and then the minute we went in. There was a band playing Nathan Carter and sure she was oh, at the dance floor straight away resist, and I was flinging her around for the night then. We didn't get home till about 12 o'clock, I'm sure. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, that's how you do it. That's it. Core memories. How's uh, the stand-up going? Like, uh, it's it's going. Like, <laughs> it's a... It's, it's, uh, like dancing, you know, you're comfortable with PJ, yeah. like your, your, your podcasting is great. Yeah. It's just a two of you and like guess whatever else. Great yeah. Throwing yourself into the stand-up market, mm. like that's hard. It's daunting because you, you did this uh, solo stand-up show cliche. Yeah, yeah. Uh, go on, tell us <laughs> it because it bit, sounds like there's a it bit was, of... It was a, it was a bit more like nerve wracking obviously, because you're just like standing up in front of everyone. And obviously, yeah. like the show was, it was a lot about like stories from when I was growing up younger and stuff like this. So it's just like, obviously, if you're recording a podcast or like you're rehearsing a dance piece, like you can do it over and over again. Or like you can be like, oh, let's edit that bit out. But like mm. if a joke bombs on stage, mm. you're just like scratching your head. So I just had a few plants in the audience of my friends. And I was like, if I tell the worst joke in the world and no one laughs, you better be rolling around on that floor <laughs> laughing. Did you? Well, like, well, it's friends who really come see idea. me. I, I, I wasn't strategic. Like, oh. I was like, I was like, you're coming to see me, but you have to laugh if it's bad. And they were like, okay. Because that's the thing. Because podcasting is revealing anyway. You're kind of yeah. a bit vulnerable, but you're not waiting a beat to get the laugh. Yeah, so that's I know what very you mean. different than being on stage waiting for the audience. Yeah, react to I know. But I just think it's because, like, as well, I just can't really kind of shut up. You know what I mean? I just like, I'm like, sometimes I'm like, will I be this like mysterious type that everyone's like, oh, who's that cool guy in the corner? But I just can't stop talking. So I was like, just get me on stage and I'll just talk some more, you know. So go on, did any joke bomb? No, it was, I was actually grand. It was actually grand. To be honest, it, like, it got a really good reception. And I was like, okay, thank God I can like relax now, you know. Would you do oh. it again? Um, not in the near future. Me and Kevin are going to go on tour now soon that yeah. I do the podcast with. Yeah. Um, and we're buzzing for that. Me and June, little plug. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. that's, yeah. that's going to be very exciting as well. We did mention uh, you got all dolled up. I did. In drag. Yeah. For the very first time. You'll do it better if you say what your drag name was. So I let the audience choose because oh. they came on a journey with me. Like I hosted um, a drag show called House of Wig for these queens that I know. And they kind of tricked me. So they were like, you can host. And then during the show, I slowly got into drag, right? <gasps> um, and so the audience came on a journey with me and I gave them a few options. I was like, these are my options for drag names. And they went with Siobhan, your knickers. <laughs> <laughs> Which I was like, okay, that was like my second favourite. My main favourite, I wanted to be called the cat's mother. So when I come on stage, I'd go, who is she? And everyone would go, the cat's mother. <laughs> but they went with Siobhan, your knickers. And she's, she's lovely as well. So this is you getting... Oh That's, my God. Yeah. So this is quite funny, because what happened with the, the, the cap that you used? It won't fill my head. <laughs> Like I, I, I have a massive head yeah, as well. Yeah, the giant head community giant at head, home. We stand heads. with you, like <laughs> it's getting a hat. Like I have to wear men's hat. Yeah, I'm getting a custom a cowboy <laughs> hat for Paddy's Day because none of them will fit my head. <laughs> hey, can, how does that? Look at that, that like, transformation. Wow. What size feet are you even? 
<laughs> to me, like I'm size eleven. I'm size eleven. Yeah, and but, as well, also I was wearing like six inch heels, so like bait yeah. my head off every door frame because I wasn't uh, used to the new height, course. you know. Oh. Also, I was kind of terrifying because I was like this like giant. Well, you person. are like you're a big dude. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I and need like, a yeah. stool to give you a hug. Like, yeah. do you go online? Like, how do you even order an outfit like so, that? So basically, it it took a village to create the drag queen. A mm -hmm. village of drag queens, <laughs> and so like. <laughs> Uh, drag queen Victoria's Secret gave me her costume. Shakira gave me her Amazing. wig. Veda Lady gave me her boots. You know what I mean? It Who was, gave you the boobs and the butt? Um, the boobs were um, my own. No, I'm joking. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, it's just the way the dress is shaped. I actually didn't have anything oh, in you there. Not? Yeah, it's all an illusion. Good for you. It's all an illusion. And then the butt, um, I just did a few squats backstage. No, I didn't. <laughs> um, Victoria's Secret gave me her old. Oh, bum. I see. Yeah. And you incorporated dance and you came out and did the full yeah. performance. So now, the dancer knew you got yeah, to came, perform. Yeah, came alive. Just yeah. back. Yeah. Now, newfound respect for them, though. It's the most painful thing ever. Oh, I'm wearing heels. five pairs of tights. <gasps> I have a corset. You can't go for a wee. Oh, the wee. Yeah, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, whatever. But I loved it. Then when I was finally in drag, I was like, I could flip a table. I'm drunk with power. Yes. Because like, you, you become a character, you know? Um, and then I just got to perform like a pop star. Like. So, like, because wow. talk about the, the stand-up. Like, you're yeah. kind of, oh, let's see. Yeah. But this, you'll do again. Yeah, cause, well, no. I don't know. Oh. It, it takes ages. <laughs> oh. it took, Who are you telling? It took me two hours to do the makeup. Not me. But Annie Query is another queen <laughs> did my makeup. It took me two hours to get into makeup. Then all the stuff, I was like, Jesus, I'd be wrecked. You know what I, I mean? Know. But I don't know. I'll see. I, I did love being on stage as, like, a different character. Because, like, I wasn't PJ. I was Siobhan your knickers, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Is this, like, an engagement place? This is an engagement. No, this isn't my actual engagement ring. Oh, yeah. it's beautiful. Yeah, I love it. It's wow. a vintage number. So this number. is Jose you're engaged Jose, to. Jose, yeah, yeah, Jose, yeah, yeah. sorry, yeah. apologies. Yeah. Oh, look, I love yeah. that. Uh, I'll always get a shot of the ring. In oh, September. Oh, September. Oh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> September, yeah. Um, West Cork, get married in. Can't wait to go back. A lot of Jose is originally from the Philippines. A lot of his cousins are coming over. They're seeing wow. Ireland for the first time. Wow. And like my favorite thing to do is show off Ireland. Oh, I'm like, ah. and as well, I'd be putting on an accent sometimes. I'd be like, look at these gorgeous hills, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's I getting just, more and more Yeah, and down the West Cork is gorgeous. So yeah, of course. Around, They're yeah. a poor family trying to understand the accent as I well. Know, <laughs> I know, I know. Jeez, they've got their work cut out. Yeah, they're great. Uh, who's, like, who's in charge, like, who's doing most of the work? Or we're, it's quite, we're collabing on the wedding. Oh, great. Okay. Um, With but, brands? What, no. Oh, <laughs> I was like, <laughs> oh, are you using this? Just, well, if any brands are listening, if any brands are listening, like, it's an expensive tea, girl. I know. Right, but no, we're not. We're, we're like, we're good. <laughs> we're good at like being like, okay, so you handle this, I handle this. Right. And as well, so go on, what are you in charge of? Like, I'm doing like basically, we can stay on this like island thing where we're getting married, and like, I'm trying to like allocate the pla p places to everyone, and then looking for, I want to get a Kaylee band. For that, like, just get the party going, you know. Well, we I mean? know where you're going to find one, yeah. Because yeah. obviously, you're hosting the Kaylee this weekend, yeah. Uh, I'm very excited. Uh, so it's in Collins Barracks on the yes. 16th, yeah. Can't wait. We're calling it Gaily Moore, okay. Gaily right, sorry. Right. Yeah, just because we're saying you can dance with whoever you want, yeah. Oh, so, yeah. Do you know, like traditionally in a Kaylee, like it'd be like men and women together, Boys yeah. And do you know what I mean? Girls, and it'd be like whatever. now the women cross, now we're just like we're doing more, um positions we'd be like people on the right cross people on the left cross and it just increases people's chance of getting a kiss after you know what i mean that's what it's all about and that's all i'm here for you yeah, know yeah making that's love happen bring us the back Kaylee to the irish the Gaelic, college days wants. you know oh fantastic oh, yeah. how do people get tickets can they rock up on the day what's the best yeah, way to get so in touch yeah so tickets are selling quickly okay even though there's one there, there's like thousands sold already but there's a, there's some left so uh, if you just look up i think if you look up mother culture club okay. um it'll pop up okay Brilliant. very good yeah, okay well that's uh happened this uh, st patrick's weekend you did last year as well and of course my I'm Grand Mam is going on, going on tour, tour as well. That show is so, the tour. Uh, oh, that's going to be very exciting too. Uh, PJ, great to have you with us. Yeah, lovely, lovely to, to see you. Thanks, Thanks so much for having me on. Crack is good. We'll get it's full drag next time, oh, Siobhan. All right. Next time <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, we'll give you plenty of time. We'll get you into drag as well, will we? Oh, uh, we'll see. I'll maybe seal seal the shoes. <laughs> exactly. What's that? Exactly. If you're size, size 11, 11. You're too. grand. Uh, all right. Still to come, we're going to meet the boy bands making country music cool again. Uh, yes, Kill are going to be stopping by for a musical performance, and you don't want to miss it. Now, we have a lovely item for you now, from fabulous fashion to amazing accessories. Irish companies are making their mark in the world of business. And we've got three entrepreneurs with us this morning. And first off, I'm joined by uh, Zoe Daly from Eru. 
So, good morning to good you. Good morning. And tell us where you got the name, because I didn't know, and we, sh we should all know. Yeah, I'm delighted to say that Eru is the patron goddess of Ireland. So it's Eru, where Era came from, the Irish word for Ireland. Yeah. So it's where Ireland came from. From Ireland came from, and that's the name of your company. Yes. And none of us here knew it. <laughs> how did we not know that? So tell us how this company started. So it all started from my grandmother, who's from Sligo, an amazing knitter. So everybody in Ireland knows a good knitter. And if you're lucky enough to get a handmade piece, it's something very special. Usually keep it forever. She made me a baby blanket for my baby nine years ago. And Similar to this, this yes, is one of your baby based, blankets that's based here. On her design. Yeah. Oh, this so, is based on her design. Yeah. So I thought it'd be a great idea to, to start it off as a little business and I wanted to get the wool direct from the farmer and right. do this whole traceable farm to yarn story. When I went to get the wool, there was no Irish wool. Yeah, it's dramatically fallen. We have yeah. sheep in this country in the thousands, but yeah. the farmers just don't, it's not profitable for them anymore. It's, it's been devalued. Like there, it's, it's kind of a complex situation, but ultimately Irish wool has been devalued. The, the farmers are in crisis. It's more expensive for them to shear a sheep than it is to sell their fleece. Right. So we are trying to re-incentivize farmers by paying them 10 times over industry price to work on kind of selecting their flocks. We work with select breeds to grow and maintain these select breeds. My, my partner, Lionel Mackey, he's a farmer and a businessman. And together we started the company understanding this whole crisis about, about Ireland. So, yeah, we're incentivizing these farm to yarn networks. We're, um, That's we're amazing that you're actually paying them 10 times over the odds just to try and keep the business going. And that's where your, your motto comes from, from farm to yarn. Exactly. So, so we hand select the fleeces. We know all the farmers by first name. So it was important for us that to, to do everything in this way. So our pieces are all, they're spun up in Donegal yarns. They're then sent to our two aunts in Dublin and Lucan who hand make every item. So it's amazing. So, so they, they get these when it's the, the yarn is like this and it's sent to them. Yes, exactly. So it's slow fashion. And the idea is they're heirloom pieces. They're made to last forever, to hand down, to keep. It's the opposite of fast well, fashion. You would, I'm sure people like this would have got a little blanket like this from their granny. It's handed down to their kids and their kids and they still have it That's years and years later. Yeah. yeah, because wool is an incredible natural fibre. It lasts, it improves with wear, it's breathable, it's temperature regulating. At the end of its days, it goes back into the soil to nourish the earth. It sequesters two kilos of carbon for every kilo of wool. It's an incredible fibre that we have on our doorstep in Ireland and, and it's so going to waste. Show us some of your pieces here because, and like, I mean, when you know the farmers who are doing this, you could nearly probably name the sheep that yeah. it's come from. So then when you, we, we talk about the word that we see a lot of time as guaranteed Irish, you are guaranteeing this. Exactly. That's why we're so proud to be a member of Guaranteed Irish because we truly are you know, one of the only people that are able to, to literally guarantee that all our wool is Irish. We're working with communities, which is what Guaranteed Irish is all about, supporting the local communities. Sheep farmers are in desperate need of that and they're doing their best then for us. We have shearers that are standing over every fleece yeah. to make sure it's shorn beautifully. We're, just, we're together working on putting a value back. back. And, and just show some of the pieces here. These are blankets, these yes, are troughs for exactly. your, your couches. These, you... are, these are family blankets. The, the Clintons each have one of these. Apparently they wear them every night watching Netflix, I really? was told. Yeah. Bill so, and Hillary. Bill and Hillary. There you go. So, Name um, dropping here as you do. <laughs> Why not? Uh, yeah, so, you know, we have... Our, our wool we actually sell also to the knitters. Oh, so okay. we, we have knit kits, you can make your own um, designs and we're selling them to designers as well. And if people want to find out more, Eru Ireland is on Insta, so people yeah. find out all the information there. Listen, uh, a lovely success story, Zoe, thank you so much for joining thank you. us. Karen, over to you. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, look at this for a pop of colour. This is absolutely stunning. Uh, Caroline Duffy, it's lovely to see you here this morning. Thank you. Which came first? I'm looking at your beautiful painting here on the canvas and then we transgress all the way over to the beautiful kimonos and dressing gowns. So did it start with you as an artist and then you decided to go into textiles? Yeah, it all started with me as an artist. Always loved painting from, from a kid. And then my dad was a great gardener. So you'd always, if I wasn't anywhere, you'd find me in the garden looking into flowers. Really? So it's really always been about flowers and creating and but then when the funny thing when I went to college I just thought I wanted to be a painter and I yeah. just happened to come across you know the course printed textiles mm -hmm. tried it for a little bit and then I was hooked wow the fabric. your yeah. jobs then took you right around the world you were working in yeah. Tokyo Sydney yeah well not Tokyo but New York first. oh sorry 
Get my big we'll do that. Mixed up. No, no, we'll do that the next time. <laughs> but uh, no, my first job, my first job was New York and it was amazing, a great yeah. experience. So working for other brands, selling, you know, prints, floral prints for that went down the runway wow. and into homewares. So it's been it's been good. Wow. They're a tonic on a day like today, I have to say, with all that wet weather. Yeah. And what you were showing me earlier is that a cushion like this, like it's reversible. So was, yes. it, is it, was it important to you as a designer that yeah. you kind of had, you know, that variety within your pieces? Oh, definitely. You know, um, you know, my whole ethos is nearly like, you know, spreading positivity yeah. and joy and flowers give that to me. So I was like, well, I have to use that in some way to give that back to other people. And I just, well, I love a bold, I love florals, but I love a bold stripe and it just Gorgeous. really, you know, modernizes it. So if you feel like florals one day, you can have it flip the cushion around if you want to, you know, be a little bit more. I don't know, cool and edgy. I <laughs> love that. And these beautiful cushions then are resting on these blankets. And again, yeah. they're reversible. Yeah, so the blankets are reversible as well. You know, that comes with the process of weaving that you're going to get a different colorway on one side or the other. So depending on your mood as well or what look you want in your room, yeah, reverse your blanket. What made you yeah. want to start up your own business? Oh, well, I think, it, you know, so I was working for their businesses and freelancing when I came back to Ireland, had my three kids and, you know, working for their businesses was great. You know, I could do the job, look after the kids. And then as time went on, it's like, you know, in my heart, I need to do some more. Mm. So four years ago, I said, right, I'm just going to paint. I just mm. want to paint and paint. And that just took off on Instagram. Wow. And my people are saying, can I buy them? I'm like, absolutely. Yes, you can. <laughs> and then, but I think my whole love of textiles kicked back in again. Yeah. And I started with my first scarf and now I have silk kimonos and yes, dresses. Would the kimonos be kind of your kind of hero pieces within your collections? Yes, I think so. But I have lovely long dresses as well. Okay. So between the kaftan, the long dress and the kimono, they're such a versatile piece. You can wear it as a dress and then you can wear it open like I'm wearing it today. Yeah, dress it looks it down. beautiful the way you have it yeah, in a jumpsuit. Just, just open, yeah. What kind of sports it. have you had as an entrepreneur? Oh, well, there's, there's great supports in Ireland now um, when you go looking for it, um, especially at the moment, Guaranteed Irish have been amazing. There's network events, connecting with other businesses, mm -hmm. you know, kind of learning from other businesses. We all bring to the pot all our experiences and we can all share it with each other. Um, but it's been amazing to have them. And it's kind of like a, a symbol that you're Irish yeah. and then I'm helping support my local community because I outsource the making, the printing of my wow. notebooks and prints. And, you know, you're kind of your little community that you Fab. work with. Well, Caroline, yeah. you found in stock is throughout Ireland. But if people want yeah. to see it quickly this morning, they can check at carolineduffydesigns.com. That's it. Yes. Super stuff. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Tommy, what have you been looking at this morning? Then? Uh, well, thank you very much, Karen. Yes, I am here with Kate O'Neill with her brand of vegan handbags, vegan leather handbags uh, under the name Cal. Good morning to you, Good morning. Kate. Uh, tell me. How do you make a, a vegan handbag, vegan leather? Yeah, well, ours in particular are actually made out of apples, which is really interesting. Um, so it's from the juice industry, all the waste that gets left over, the peels and the cores and everything. They ground it up into like a powder and then they're able to transform it into this gorgeous leather-like material. It's really durable, it's really soft. It's very similar to actual real leather as well. Um, so it's a great alternative. From apples? Yeah, I know. That's incredible. <laughs> because you, you turned vegan or vegetarian yeah. and you decided that, you know, instead of the standard leather that we see out there, which is either really cheap or yeah. very, very expensive, you thought this would be a great alternative. Exactly. Yeah, vegan leather can tend to just be pure plastic and it's really cheap and it can kind of fall apart. So I wanted to create something that was much better quality and also something that was made from recycled materials. You know, I was working in Brown Thomas a couple of years ago and I used to always go over and admire all the gorgeous handbags but I really just noticed there wasn't any vegan leather alternatives, especially nothing that was in my price range. So I decided to create my own. And you've got it with sustainability at, at the heart of it as at well. At the core. And at the core. Co I love it, love it. Um, so obviously you said you were working in makeup in Brown Thomas. You've obviously, you've won uh, the Arnott's Pitch 23 competition. Yes. So now you are stocked yes. in Arnott's, yeah, you know, of course, are. which is linked with uh, Brown Thomas. It's like a full circle moment. I know, you. it's crazy. It feels surreal still, you know. Um, Arnott's have just been so incredible in terms of their support and like mentoring along the way and we're very lucky to be able to continue selling there um, both in store and online so it's very exciting. And from going from makeup artist into starting your own business and in leather and in handbags like it's a bit of a jump. Yeah. What inspired you to do it? Well, I've always loved fashion and beauty, you know, from a really young age. I feel like they kind of go hand in hand almost. Um, 
So yeah, I've had like an equal interest for both. I still love makeup, but uh, this has kind of taken my, my priority at the minute. And I love that they're affordable as well. So you have the, the over the shoulder one is what, what price is it? Yes, so the shoulder bag is 120, 120. And then we have a cross body bag here for 130. But these actually come with two different straps that you can swap out. So you have like multiple looks in one. So you can wear it for like every occasion. Cool. I want them to be really versatile and like something that you can wear to anything. And Callow the name. So this has come from, is this you and your boyfriend? It's very so, embarrassing. Uh, Kate O'Neill and Michael O'Malley. Yes, well, it's actually so everybody calls Michael Mallow. That's his nickname. So okay. it's Kate and Mallow, which is Callow. So embarrassing. He hates telling the story, but <laughs> I own it. <laughs> uh, and of course, you've got hair bands as well here. I thought yes. I'd try one. Yeah, I know you're like, eyeing up the orange one. It's what very, price are these? Good, good with the shirt, isn't it? Uh, yeah. So the hair bands are twenty euro, and they're also made from recycled plastic as well. So. Very good, very good. And in terms of support, like, you know, you've always been given a lot of support to try and help get your business up and going, but like, where does the future go for Callow? Oh, we've a lot of plans. Um, as I said, we're lucky to be able to continue our relationship with Aronitz and continue getting their guidance. Um, so that's kind of where we're, our main focus is at the minute, but also bringing out new products. You know, we're working on some fun colors for summertime and yeah, just really trying to scale up now is, is our main focus. It's so, so impressive. Thank and you. with apples at the core of it as there well. Go. So doing <laughs> good for the business. Uh, Kate O'Neill with Callow uh, Handbags. Congratulations. People can find you in Arnott's or we are Callow dot com that's it dot com. Yeah. thank you uh, after the break we're going to be catching up with the next big thing in trad music yes country crooners Kyo are going to be stopping by for a Paddy's Day special You're very welcome back. Now we're joined by band Kjol, who are bringing new life to traditional Irish music. Formed by country singer Nathan Carter, their debut album hit three million streams on Spotify within one month. Joining us now is Cahill, Matthew, Daryl and James. Good morning to you guys. How are you? It's lovely to see you. Matthew, let's start with you. So tell us about Kjol and how you got involved in the band. Me personally, yeah. I, was, um, I was actually doing a gig in a bar in Oma. And uh, Nathan was there on a stag do. And it was during the COVID restrictions, so he couldn't get up and do anything or they couldn't leave. So they had to sit and listen to me for <laughs> two hours. And then them. I got the call then to come and meet these lads. And here we are. Uh, but music is in your family then. Yeah. So this, this is right up your street. Yeah, yeah. So my dad is a singer songwriter as well. And um, it's just basically all I've known since I've started growing up. Like I've always played music since I was young. And, here I am now, I'm very lucky that it's brought me this far. <clears throat> because, Daryl, that wasn't necessarily your road because the boy band material. Yeah, so I came from, I come from kind of a musical theatre kind of background yeah. originally and then I was in a, in a boy band for a couple of years and done a bit of touring kind of a Celtic woman. Tell us stuff, what the so. boy band was. Uh, it was a band called Taken. Jesus, it feels like a lifetime ago now. Um, <laughs> we got to well, you toured. You did. You did a lot of tours. Yeah, you some, supported a lot of big acts. Yeah, we did some cool stuff. We played with like JLS, Codeline, The Wanted, and did some good TV stuff and got to travel a good bit. So it was a good experience. But... Yeah. And so was this type of music then in your system at all, or was it not? Or like, uh, how did you get involved in it then? Like, did you really take to it easy? I've always been in, like, I've always been into folk and trap music, but never really performed it. You know, I was more, like I said, more into the musical theatre and the kind of the pop stuff. So uh, it was a bit new to me, but I think I took to it fairly quick. Yeah. The lads might disagree now. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us, lads. Look at them looking at you there, going, "Not really." It took a bit of work from Lee McKenna to put it all in place. Your manager, who's obviously in music industry as well, so did that help to have Nathan and Liam, who are in the music industry, know it when putting us together. They knew the pitfalls to look out for at the start. Yeah, it's great because the lads give us <coughs> guidance. Obviously, Liam in the music industry, he's he knows stuff that you wouldn't even believe. Yeah. And then Nathan there is great as well because musically he can just come on and be like, oh, maybe you should try this. And the other great thing about the two lads is they don't, they're not overbearing. So they're not like, this is what you have to do. Like, there's a lot of freedom for us to make mm. our own decisions. And so if people then have never heard of you, tell us, just give us a little synopsis of what the type of music you do. Is there a bit of a flavour to it? I guess we're trying to kind of modernise trad and folk music yeah. a little bit slightly and bring... To get away from the sitting in the corner, the yeah, pub type yeah, of thing. Yeah, yeah. A bit of a commercial element yeah. to it, you know, and try and... Make, try a, and make a show of it, kind of. <laughs> and try and bring it back to maybe a younger audience and almost, like, revive it again, you know, yeah. and give it yeah. a new, a new and lease the main life. key is, as well, is whenever we do it live, it's all about having the crack. So, like, the crack <laughs> we have on stage, us four lads, is just... That's our main thing. But, but it, the type of music that you're playing lends to that, yeah, though, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Because you can really get yeah, it going. If yeah. you're at a good trad session, yeah. there's nothing quite like it. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. 
And so tell us, you have a new album out. I have it here. It's, uh, it's cool. So what are the type of songs? You were saying there's different type of songs on this. Yeah, yeah. So there's a uh, Tom Petty song there, Free Fallen, which is one people might know as well. So we took that and we put a trad spin on it. And then we have... We have a couple of originals on it. We have um, we have Beeswing that was doing really, really well for us as well. So there's something for everyone on it. Yeah. It's one of those albums. There's something for everyone. And of course, you were saying about performing, and that's mm -hmm. what you're doing. You're going to be mm -hmm. cel celebrating Paddy's Weekend in the UK. Yeah. And yeah. so <clears throat> touring is the big thing as well for you now, Absolutely, getting out yeah. there and doing festivals. Yeah. We have a busy summer ahead, and we just got back from the UK yesterday. I'm heading back tomorrow again to do a Paddy's Week tour. So. We're looking forward to that now. Yeah. And Top then all the people here can see you during the summer? Yeah, yeah so doing... for anyone that's interested yeah. in coming to see us over the summer, you can find all our dates on www.kyoban.com. <laughs> Kyoban.com. Yeah. And uh, you're going to play us out. So what song are you going to play for us? Why did you choose this one? This is at the Ferryman. Yeah. Beautiful Dublin song. Yeah, yeah, beautiful Dublin song. And it's <laughs> also a single of ours that you can find on all social media and all that stuff as well. So we thought it'd be good to do it for Paddy's Day. It's one of our favourite songs to play. So, uh, so touring... The new album, so it's all going really well for you. It's all mm -hmm. you're all happy. Happy, yeah. living the dream. Ha yeah, living the dream. Living the dream. Well, listen, it's lovely to have you in this morning. And as I say, the lads are going to play out the ferryman at the end of the show. But uh, let's find out what's happening on tomorrow's show. Over to the lads. Oh, thanks very much, Anne. Look forward to seeing you guys coming up on World Sleep Day tomorrow, where we've advice on catching some much needed <laughs> shot eye. We need. Says <laughs> like National Ireland uh -huh. Day. We talk about so much here. Also, Carnation Street and Casualty Star Tristan Gemmel will be joining us. And we're continuing to showcase the best in Irish cuisine for the week that's in it. So there's a homemade spice bag for lunch. Absolutely perfect. All that plus the new sport and weather you're waking up to. We are back. Well, I'm not, but the gang will be. Me neither. Here either. From we'll seven. see the weekend crew now. Take it away, Kyle. All the little boats are from the breast of our feet. Every man is stranded on the key. Share the Dublin docks are done, and the way of life is gone. And Molly was part of me. It's where the strong.